will be joining us uh, in just a few minutes, but we are uh, pleased today to uh, be able to gather uh, in this place uh, to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to hear God's word proclaimed uh, from our uh, special guest speaker, and to lift our voices in praise. So will you join me please as we begin our time uh, in prayer. Oh God, as we still our hearts before you, uh, we recognize you as the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We bow in your presence to acknowledge your greatness, to thank you for your grace, to ask today for your help, your strength, your enablement of your spirit. As your word is proclaimed and as we lift our voices to praise you. Oh God, we thank you today for the one you have brought to uh, preach your word. Uh, we thank you for his ministry, his leadership, uh, not only here in this place today, uh, but in the world of Christian higher education around the world. And we pray your blessings today upon John and Ruth Sinyoni. We pray that your favor might rest upon the work of Uganda Christian University. And we ask today that the gospel would to go forth uh, to the nations uh, through that place. So as we gather today, we ask that you would be pleased with our worship, that you would receive it in spirit and in truth as we seek to honor your majestic name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. In just a few minutes, Jonathan and the praise band will be uh, leading us as we sing uh, together, and then we'll hear God's word uh, read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then our speaker for today uh, is Dr. John Signoni, a graduate of this uh, institution. He has returned today to his alma mater, and we are so glad to have him back on the Trinity uh, campus. He was here from 1989 to 1992, where he received his theological training. Uh, his first calling was originally in the area of mathematics. He holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Melbourne and has invested his life in the work of higher education. Uh, since 2000, he has been on the leadership team at Uganda Christian University, and since 2010, he has served there as the president and vice chancellor, uh, a strategic role in what is the largest uh, Christian university on the continent of Africa, one of the most significant uh, Christian institutions in the work of global Christian higher education. So we are delighted to have Dr. Signoni uh, here uh, with us today. He is an ordained minister in the Anglican Church, so we are pleased not only to have the Reverend Dr. Signoni, but Canon Signoni uh, here, and his lovely wife, Dr. Ruth Signoni, who is a counselor and also uh, was a, an alum of this uh, place. So join me, please, as we begin our time today by welcoming Signoni's back to the Trinity Campus. Our reading this morning is from the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 25. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you, what I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 
not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are, per to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Uh, it's such a joy to be back at Trinity. As you heard from President Okere, I was here together with my wife and our children, at least two of them. 1989 to 1992, and uh, Trinity in many ways formed who we eventually have become, and we are very thankful to God for that, uh, for this special, special time that we spent in this place. And thanks for the reading of God's word, so I'll ask that we pray and then share from it. Blessed Father, thank you for this morning, an opportunity once again to hear your voice, we rejoice that we have Jesus and that he was crucified for us. Lord, we know that without him, we would not be what we are. But you've been so good to us. You've loved us so exceedingly and extravagantly. So help us to see that afresh as we look once again at what you have given us and what you have done and indeed the ministry that you've put in our hands, that will serve you faithfully and honor you with everything we are. Speak to me so that you may speak through me and make your word clear, even as we open it today, to the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, first of all, let me say how thankful once again to be back, how thankful we are. Uh, we've not been to Trinity since the early 2000s. Uh, we do come to the U.S. every year, so this is a very special treat for us uh, to be able to come back. And when we arrived in the U.S., especially when we were traveling in the East, uh, we didn't see any snow in Pittsburgh, so we said, now, shall we see snow in Chicago? Because that's what we were used to. And thank God we were given the opportunity to be able to see some snow. Thank you for the cold reception. <laughs> now this morning I thought that I would share with you about the heart of the gospel. Quite often, I've had opportunity to listen to preachers, especially on television or radio or something like that. And very often I wonder whether... People, preachers these days, still know what the heart of the gospel is all about. I come out of a tradition that understood that the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified is the most important message that we can bring. And I think what Paul is trying to do for us here is once again to remind us that the heart of the gospel is Jesus Christ crucified. Many years ago in the East African revival, Christians were gathered, and by tradition in the East African revival, people would start sharing their testimonies. And of course, many of them would be very excited. So there comes this young man. He stands before the fellowship of believers, 
And he's so excited about finding Jesus. To the extent that he starts saying, I am Jesus, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. Now there happened to sit an old woman in the congregation. She got up. She went to this young man while he was at the front, took his hand and started examining it. And the young man couldn't understand what was happening and examining it until, until she said, oh, you are not the one. You don't have the scars of the cross. Friends, one day each one of us shall be in the presence of God. And when we come in the presence of God, one of the things that I look forward to seeing is to see the one who was crucified for me. Those scars that he bears, even in glory, are a reminder that the gospel that we preach revolves around this one thing, that Jesus was crucified for us. These are difficult days when people are defining and redefining the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But Paul reminds us in Galatians, he says, there is no other gospel. There is no other gospel, only one gospel. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ who was crucified for us. And the rest are just imitations. There are many preachers today who go around speaking. And for those of you who are here, I know that you're being prepared for ministry. If you're a student or if you're not, you are definitely preparing for ministry. All theologizing, I want to say, all theologizing becomes empty if it does not lead us to Jesus Christ crucified. That is the one message that we need to be reminded of. And so we need to remember that in all our preaching, unless we put Jesus at the center of what we speak, unless we bring out the one who was crucified for us, we sang that song, that last song, and what a wonderful song. Thank you so much for leading us in that song. I listened to the words, it was my first time, and I like it when, when we sing a song and I can actually understand the words. You know, because these days there are many songs you can't hear even the words that are being sung. But when I can understand the words, and just listening to the words of the cross and what was accomplished for us in the cross is something very special for us. The devil always wants to distract us from this teaching of the cross of Jesus. Paul actually argues that the preaching of the cross is intellectually foolish. It doesn't make any sense. The world cannot understand it. Because when you talk about the cross, they wonder why should we believe in a man who was crucified? Islam has gone as far as denying that he actually died on the cross. Because they don't want to accept it. Because this Jesus was so good, they have a very high view of Jesus. But the cross is the stumbling block. And they say, no, 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 there can't be. Jesus is not one who died. There was an exchange on the cross. You see how the cross becomes a stumbling block to many. Like Paul even speaks here. And yet, we must insist all the time that without the cross, there is no Christianity. Without the cross, there is no salvation. Without the cross, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the cross, we cannot become children of God. Without the cross, we can't have eternal life. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Now you're familiar with Mount Helen in Washington, your state here in, the Western, in the, your Western state. I come across this interesting story that when the volcanic eruption, I think this is the one around 1980 or something, of Mount Helen burnt away every living thing. Naturalists of the Foreign Service wondered if any living thing would ever grow there in the foreknown future. One day they noticed a lush patch of wildflowers. The vegetation formed the shape of an elk, a moose. It soon dawned on them that these patches appeared wherever a wild animal had died. That there was life coming out of death. Friends, as God's church, 
as theologians, as people who are preparing for ministry, and for each one of us who is preparing for ministry, we have only one message, that life is where death has occurred. And it is the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is from there that there springs forth flowers and life. So it is with the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you are crucified with Christ, you become fertile for life. That's why Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. Paul says that the heart of the gospel is not Paul, is not Apollos, is not Peter. In verse 12 of the text that we read, he says, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or are you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul asks. Was Paul ever crucified for you? He asks more emphatically. And he says, we preach Christ crucified. In verse 23, that is our one and only message that we need to proclaim. And it is the answer to all other offers of salvation. It does not matter what kind of salvation is being offered by religion or even by Christians who try to offer whatever they offer. We have only one message, that the cross of Jesus Christ is the only one. I came to the Lord Jesus Christ in 1976. Having heard this message of the cross of Jesus, a university student completely defeated. Listen, friends, I was in university, like you've heard, I was studying mathematics and I was an A student. I did not have any problem with mathematics, but I had one problem, or more than that anyway. I had a problem with my own lips. I could not control my lips. And I do remember one particular time, three of us, we had come from the same school, we were all studying at the University of Nairobi, we were all doing mathematics, and we were using this filthy, obscene language. And we agreed one evening, and we said, we need to stop using this kind of language, because we went to church. We were churched people. But for some reason, we were defeated by our own language. All of us, intelligent. In fact, all of us ended up as postgraduate students in mathematics. But listen, I was in my first year, and we agreed and said, let's stop using this language. You know, I have come to learn that the one thing you never play with is the power of sin. So we agreed, and for 24 hours, I started looking for language that I could use that was decent. I had been using this obscene language from secondary school. Now I'm in university and the language entered the university to study mathematics with me. And there I am, trying to change the language in my mouth. And after 24 hours, we were defeated. I remember how quiet I was trying to look for a good word, decent language that I could use. And I just couldn't find a single word that I could use and say, okay, now I have changed my language. Why? Because I could not break the power of sin. There was no way. So Paul affirms to us, and he says that the cross of Jesus is God's wisdom and God's power. That's what it is. We don't have to understand it intellectually. If someone tells you that the cross is wisdom, you can't understand it. In the, the Greeks tried to understand it intellectually. The Jews, they wanted miracles. They wanted signs. It didn't work. They could not understand it. But this cross that we preach, the cross of Jesus, Paul says, is the wisdom and is the power of God. And a few months down the road, I entered a small chapel, much smaller than this. Sat right at the back. The Christian students were meeting. One of the students at the end of the meeting came and sat beside me. In fact, I was with another friend and, another, uh, and someone else came and sat with him because they noticed that we were strange in this fellowship. So they started talking to us about Jesus. Jesus, 
crucified. And that day, the Lord opened my heart that evening. And I remember, after I prayed, I gave my life to Christ. I wasn't even thinking about the obscenities I was speaking. It was only a couple of days later, and I was walking with some of my colleagues who did not know Christ. And they started using the same language that was so familiar to my mouth and to my ears. And for the first time in many years, I could not even speak one obscene word. In fact, it sounded so ugly. It sounded so terrible. Why? Because the cross of Jesus Christ had canceled the obscenities in my own mouth. The power of the cross. And friends, this is exactly what I saw as I was growing up in the East African revival. Seeing thieves who were defeated by stealing, seeing people who were sexually immoral, seeing drunkards, and as they came to the cross of Jesus Christ, unable on their own to overcome their sin, and then all of a sudden the cross of Jesus just cancels everything. So when Paul says, that the cross of Jesus is God's wisdom and God's power, we don't have to understand it intellectually necessarily. Yes, we can argue and we understand a little bit. We understand partially. And what we understand, we understand truly. But the truth of the matter, the way the cross works in people's lives is way beyond us. But this one thing we can testify, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is about the cross of Jesus. It may be intellectually foolish, we may, not, we, we may not be able to understand it, but it is the cross of Jesus. And so Paul says to us that following Paul, following Apollos, following Cephas is useless because none of them was crucified for you. I belong to the Anglican Church, as you heard. I started attending the Anglican Church nine months before I was born. Seriously. You know why I say that? My father was a head teacher in a school founded by the Anglican Church. And we lived about 100 yards away from the church. And I remember vividly, my father was actually the choir master in the church. My mother was, I remember where she used to sit, without fail. So what would stop me from attending church nine months before I was born? Nothing. Nothing would stop me. But listen, he says, I, I can't, even the Anglican church could not save me. It cannot save me. Because it was never crucified for me. What Paul is actually telling us, whatever was not crucified for you, whatever was not crucified for the world, is not the gospel that we proclaim. The heart of the gospel is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the heart of the gospel. And that's the only way that people can find salvation. Because none of them, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, churches, whatever it is, none of these were crucified for them. And so it was not until I came to Jesus and I saw that Jesus was crucified for me that I was able to get my eternal life. One other thing that's very interesting, before I came to Christ, I struggled with one thought. I would go to bed and I would ask myself the question, what if I don't wake up? And I didn't know, you know, the future, the destiny was unknown. What if I don't wake up? And friends, I would spend time tossing in bed and asking myself that question until, of course, sleep would just overpower me. But I didn't know. What if I don't wake up? But the day I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I went to bed, slept like a baby. The question was answered. I know I have eternal life, and the reason for that is Jesus crucified. That is the only message that we have. That everything that we do must be around that. He's the one who transforms our lives. That when we turn to Christ, we are forgiven. When we turn to Christ, we become children of God. When we turn to Christ, we have eternal life. When we turn to Christ, we have a future. When we turn to Christ, our lives are transformed. Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God. That's who he is. Then the cross 
we are invited to that fellowship in the cross. Not to anything else. We are invited to fellowship in the cross. The Corinthians were struggling, fighting over names. Good names. I mean, Paul and Peter were apostles. What a wonderful thing. In our country, and I think I've even had some of the people, even in the United States here, people love calling themselves apostles. And they really feel, ah, that's very big. But that's, you know, Paul says, not even an apostle was crucified for you. Not even an apostle. Instead, what we are called to do is then to find fellowship when we come together to the cross of Jesus, not by reason of any merits of our own, when we come there, the ground is level. Because the merits are only the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who paid the price. He's the one who has overcome sin. He's the, one, the only one that saves us. And therefore, fellowship demands agreement about that. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And each of us comes to him because of his own merits. Jesus calls us into that fellowship with his own people for this one reason that we are all called to the same. We come with nothing. We don't have anything that we bring. In fact, the only contribution that we make to our salvation is our sin. That's the only thing. I, don't, I didn't contribute anything. And none of you can contribute anything. And nobody, nobody can contribute anything. Friends, what I'm saying is that we have only one message, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the power of our Lord Jesus Christ that transforms all people and makes us a very different people, that we may know what it means to walk with our God and to have a future in our life. The Lord Jesus Christ invites us that we may know what it means to walk with him. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Not I will make you a fisher of men, but he calls us into that fellowship before the cross that we may be able to go out and share the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have come as people of the one merit, which is the cross of Jesus. We are not even called, for many of our churches, for we are not even called to be ministers of rituals. That's not what I'm called to. The heart of the gospel is not in the rituals that I perform. That's not what it is. But to preach the gospel of the cross of Jesus. That is the only message that has been given to us. That we may be able to proclaim Christ and proclaim him very, very clearly. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, friends. Paul says in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. The gospel. And what does he say? And not with the words of eloquent wisdom. He does not, he's not saying that we cannot use wisdom. He's not saying that we become unintellectual. But what he's saying is that all of that never changes anything. I do remember many times how I have talked to people. And I talk to him, I talk to them, and I think I'm very clear with the gospel. I really think I'm very clear. And I'm sure you know this experience. You, you think you're very clear. You think that there's no reason. In fact, when I had just come to Christ, sometimes I would feel like boxing someone. I have shared with you the gospel. Why aren't you giving your life to Christ? <laughs> no, there are times when I would get angry. And I would say, what's wrong with this person? Yeah, but they cannot understand it. But Paul says, it's not the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Jesus be emptied of its power. Only the cross of Jesus is the message that we do have, that we can take to the world, that we can communicate to the world, that we can bring before them. And he goes on, and he says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Having known what the cross has done for me, I know this for sure, that my life is hidden in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is nothing that can ever take that away from me. And for which I'm truly thankful. That for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Friends, 
Although a student harvested me and brought me in the kingdom. And each share with you, it was an old man. He had come to Christ. This man had a story behind him by the time I knew him. I was told that this man had actually raped women and he had a child by rape, actually. He had a child by rape. But by the time I knew him, he was a minister in the church. The Lord had saved him. He had brought him to the cross of Jesus and transformed him. And as I looked at his life, it looked like those stories were not the right stories about him. But this man was so holy, was so different. Because he had been touched by Jesus crucified. The power of God had completely changed him. And it is his testimony. I had an opportunity actually to preach one time before he died, to preach where he was being honored. And I say to him, there is one person who led me to Christ. It is you. Because of the life that you lived before us. That it was lived so openly, we could see what was happening, and we rejoiced in the fact that this man's life had been changed by the cross of Jesus Christ. So Paul asks, where then is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? In other words, where is the wisdom of this age? Where is the power of this age? Friends, let us not be tempted at any time to preach anything else but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in the cross that, that we have the wisdom, that we have the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach. And he concludes in verse 24, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That is the cross of Jesus. So if you ask me, what is the heart of the gospel? What is it that we need to be preaching? What is it that we need to believe that we may be changed, that we may be transformed? I have only one answer, the cross of Jesus Christ. It is that which I have heard from infancy, from childhood, I have known, and it is that which actually brought me close to him. And as Jesus himself said, I, when I'm raised up, will draw all men to myself. To the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is where we need to invite people to come, and that we may come in fellowship and go out to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim him clearly. You and I are called to be faithful to the heart of the gospel, namely the crucified Savior. You have no other message. You have nothing else. And for those of you who are still studying here, if you complete your studies and you have all your theologizing or whatever else may have been done, does not lead you to understand, to know Jesus even deeper, to know the crucified Savior and to go and serve him as the crucified Savior and not to preach anything else but the crucified Savior, then you'll have wasted your time at Trinity. Friends, that's the only message that I know of that has transformed lives over the centuries. And may God bless you as you continue to serve him. Thank you very much. Now let's stand for benediction. Let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.